let's dig in. Bert Reggiani, great Sunday morning, everyone. Scott Wheeler is in the house and saying happy Pentecost. Looks like Scott is on YouTube. Bert and Christine are on Facebook. We've got a number of other people popping in. Um, so good morning, everyone, getting their coffee and uh, baked goods or whatever they're getting. Um, yeah, what a, what a week. Uh, we've had here in the coffee shop. Um, I mean, not only uh, Jennifer had some illness in the family, so and a death in the family, so so she had some time off this week, and so Kimberly and I had more time to be hands-on. But man, oh man, did we have some great conversations with people, and and um, just so good. This this place is doing exactly what we dreamed it would do, um, and we might even see people today in church because of the coffee shop being open. That, that is the way it's designed. So, very good. Hans, good morning. Ed and Donna Phillips, good morning. Elder Tim is in the house. Hey, you got some hairs cut. Oh, all right, all right. All right, everyone. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 14, we're at the end. I think we'll start at verse 19 and then roll to the end and get into chapter 15. I'm looking for some suggestions on what you might want to study next. Revelation. Um, yeah, Revelation. Yeah. Revelation. Yeah. Revelation. 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 All right. All of you. All of you on the. Uh, on our virtual campus, um, we've got some people here wanting to study the book of Revelation. Um, I know there's some jealousy going on because I'm doing it with the men on Thursday. Um, so if you would like to do a study on the book of Revelation, let me know. Let it, give, me, give me some feedback. Uh, Anne-Marie, good morning. Uh, the Burrells, good morning. So sorry about the dog. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so much we go through in this life. Man. Um, So, Book of Revelation. Is that, is that a for Sunday morning or is that maybe a Monday night? Session? No, no, no. I think we can do it on Sunday morning. Um, yeah, Aaron, let's, let's because I want to show that video, you know, the video that I show on Thursday nights, we got to take that step of making the, the TV go into those speakers. We got to get that um, in, in a few weeks because I'll be ready for the Revelation study. Um, so, so, so just just be aware, just be aware that Pastor Tom Donnelly does not have what I think would be a common understanding of the book of Revelation. I think that the American church has been inundated by speculative hermeneutics where you study the Bible and you just kind of want to make it say what you want to make it say because you're looking at picture language and you're looking at beasts and horns and heads and 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 um, so uh, uh, you're, you're going to be facing a a um, a pastor that has a pretty conservative way in which he looks at hermeneutics and how we are tied to interpret scripture and um, so just know that as we go into the that study of Revelation. Um, Greg is saying wrong mic. What does that mean? Greg is saying wrong mic. Can everybody hear me out there in the virtual world? He has wrong mic question mark. It, oh, is it possible that it's, it's, it's got the wrong... Yeah, change that to the razor mic. Right there. No, they could hear me, but it was just the wrong microphone. So um, tell me if you can hear me now, Greg, uh, without an echo. Yeah, the, the, the problem was is that we were on the microphone on the camera instead of this microphone, so we switched it. Um, Anne-Marie says, can't hear well. How about now? Christine says, better? So that's good. Um, much better, Anne-Marie says. All right. Um, 
Mike has switched. Good. All right, and to our friends at Firmly Rooted Greendale, good morning and welcome. And it looks like they've got a vote on yes for <laughs> Revelation. So, all right. All right, so when we finish the book of Romans, we will, we will do a study on Revelations. Know that every, every morning we'll have a video that enters us into the Bible study because um, some of you may be familiar with the Bible Project. Uh, they have videos about on every book of the Bible, and they did an amazing job on the book of Revelation. And so we're going to use that as an introductory base as we go into each of them. So yeah, Josette says we're sounding much better. All right, yeah, somehow my microphone switched, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, bless the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So Romans chapter 14, verse 19, and remember this whole section has been how we treat one another, right? How we treat one another especially around religious things, right? Um, it, it, have you ever heard the phrase adiaphora? So it's a Latin phrase that, that comes from the, the things that, that Paul teaches. Adiaphora are those things that don't matter. So we shouldn't fight about them. We shouldn't fight about them. Why? Because they're not core to the faith. They're not, you know, you want, you want to talk about whether the Bible is the word of God or not. That's not adiaphora. That is a key doctrine which is necessary. The Trinity, the redemption of Jesus, Jesus being the son of God. These are things that are, cannot be compromised and there, we can fight about those. We can argue about those and hit our ground. But whether we, whether we have blue pews or red pews or whether we do high church or low church or whether we do contemporary church, these are all adiaphora. You do what you want to do. The objective is to worship, right? There is no prescribed way to do it. You do it the way that you as a body feel it ought to be done, right? And so that's why churches do worship differently. Um, whether you should honor a day, whether the pastor should wear robes and all those kinds of things or not, those are adiaphora. You can have opinions about them, but at the end of the day, Paul would tell us that they're not worth fighting over because they'll create division when the goal of the church is to create oneness. I will tell you again, the word homothumadon, one mind, is only used six times in the whole New Testament, and it's only in the first five chapters of the book of Acts, which means we screw it up. But when the church can be in one mind, it's like opening up the faucet. It is like unkinking the hose and the Holy Spirit's able to do whatever he wants. So understand, this is why Paul says don't quench the Spirit. We're the ones that get in our own way. And we're the ones that get in the Spirit's way. We're the one with the issue. And one of the things that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples is to be open to know the Spirit, sense the Spirit, and listen to the Spirit, and obey the Spirit, and do this in one mind, right? And so that's why in our board meetings, Elder Tim. When we don't do that, is that not part of mourning the Spirit? The Bible says we, can't, we have the ability to mourn yes. the Spirit. Yes, mourn the Spirit, quench the Spirit. I mean, the, that we're, you're choking it off. Choking it off, right. He's trying to do work through me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more we step into those kind of like uh, uh, Aaron calls it, Aaron calls it highlighting. It's this idea that you're, you're looking in the real world and then somebody keeps getting your attention. And you get this sense like you should pray for them or go see if they're okay. All he has simply done, Aaron has, all he has simply done is learn how to step into it. It's, it's uncomfortable. But, but, but when, when, when 85 to 90 percent of the time you're, it's accurate, you start you just you find you find it easier to step into, right? Because because the person needed to hear God's grace. Something I remember just this morning, something you told me years ago that sticks with me, and it's not about me. The situation like that, I'm making it about me. Yes. 
take me out of it and go pray for the person. Take me, and, and Tim, you're, you're, you're about ready to preach my sermon. Um, see, so, so that's good, that's good. So, no, but, but Tim, you're, Tim, you're absolutely right. I mean, if we would understand that the Pentecost is, experience is not about me, very quickly, the Pentecost experience is some disciples sitting in a room, praying, waiting for God to do what he said he was going to do, waiting anticipatingly for that to happen, and then simply obediently going out and letting the Spirit do what the Spirit wanted to do. They did not wake up that day and said, hey, let's go outside and speak in tongues. They did not. They did not wake up and say, let's go speak in other people's languages. It just happened. Why? Because of their willingness to get themselves out of the way. What might God do with us if we just got ourselves out of the way, right? And we need to be in one mind because we can be any part of the body of Jesus except the head. So we must unite ourselves with his mind and his will. And that's the goal. Every, to the, the two boards at Firmly Rooted, the executive board and, and, and the elders, it is a clear understanding that we don't do four to three votes. We don't vote for winners and losers. It's either we agree or disagree. We either do it or don't do it. It's unanimous. What in the world did the church do in America when we decided to have nine people on a board and you could have a five to four vote? What does that mean except that you're divided? Right? Five people are going to walk away going, we won, and four are going, we weren't paid attention to and we lost. At Firm the Rooted, there's no such thing. It's either yes or no. And if it's somebody's uncomfortable, then we wait. We wait. We got to press, you know, and, and it's, it's trying to press in as much as we can into getting our minds around the mind of Christ and what is his will for us, right? Firmly rooted Greendale, again, because of COVID, had their church turned upside down. Any, ener any, any inertia that we had, any, any, any positive movement that we had in the last year or so has been just torn to pieces because for so long they weren't even worshiping in the building and, and now you've lost the momentum that you had a year and three months ago, right? And so now it's, what do we do? That process has to be in one mind. It's not about opinion. God's got a plan for Firmly Rooted Greendale. God's got a plan for all the churches and we ought to be paying more attention to what he wants rather than what we think. And it's always going to be a struggle, right? It's always going to be a struggle. And why? Because it's a struggle in our personal faith, right? I sometimes don't want to do what God wants me to do. I sometimes think I have a better idea, right? Now put, put eight of us on a board, that's dangerous, <laughs> right? I mean, so that's why this surrender kind of idea, one-mindedness is not something we create one-mindedness is something the Spirit creates when we get out of our own heads and we get out of our own wills. Not my will, but thine be done. Not mine, but thine, right? All right, so that's the, that's the spirit of, of this. Um, shout out to the respectful and humble discussions of our board, Sarah says. <laughs> the Jacksons, hey, Mr. Jackson, what a great job you did Friday. I think... I think everybody has signed you up for an every Friday uh, uh, event. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I had nothing to do with it. It's not me. It's these guys. <laughs> right now, he's at home going. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron's cracking up back there. <laughs> What's that? They're going to move on Tuesday? Oh, y'all. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get to, to verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. What if, you ever been around people like, like their purpose is to fight? Like they wake up wanting to get in an argument. They wake up as an antagonist. 
I have said to people, why are you my antagonist? If I say up, you say down. If I say left, you say right. If I say white, you say black. Why? Why, why, why is that in this relationship, right? He's saying to us that, that we ought to make every effort. It takes effort to go against our human nature. It takes effort to die to ourselves and rise to the Spirit's movements. It takes work, right? Paul says, I fight the fight. I run the race. I don't punch, air, I don't punch the air, but I punch to hit. I punch to win, right? I'm running to the tape. This Christian life is not something that just lives on its own. You are a born-again individual that has a new heart and a new mind, and you, we are supposed to be exercising that so that we can put effort into the kingdom of God. And as we do that, we look to make peace and to edify. To make peace and to edify. Mutual edification. That when two Christians get together, they should leave the experience better off than when they came into it. Doesn't always happen, does it? Boy, you want a challenge? Put that verse into a marriage relationship. You should always leave mutually edified. Ah! Ouch! Oh, we got a counseling session going on right now. <laughs> Steve's rolling his eyes. But, but, do you, does, but, but see, what I want you to realize is we can so quickly get down to the earthly kingdom. We can so quickly, we can so quickly get down to this kingdom that we start to operate on the wrong principles. We have to begin to, to work on both kingdoms and we have to realize when we're here and get ourselves out of that to here or we're going to mess up relationships we're going to mess up lots of things he says do not destroy the work of god for the sake of food don't affect the work of the kingdom by arguing about whether you should eat meat or not eat don't 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 spoil the movement of the kingdom because you're arguing over this adiaphora Things that don't matter. What that means then is if Satan had a will, he would have a will that we would fight over these things so that we would affect the work of the kingdom. If we just woke up and thought about what would the enemy want right now, sometimes it's exactly what we're doing. If we just ask that question, have you ever done it? Been in, a, been in a weird situation and just simply stopped? I mean, I'm more and more, I'm pulling myself out of situations and going, what would Satan do right now? And the answer is, get me to keep saying what I'm actually saying. Get me to keep feeling exactly what I'm feeling. So what ought I do? Stop. What ought I do? Adjust. What ought I do? Apologize, maybe. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? We, if we would just, in the midst of living, ask some of the right questions, we could refine our lives. Yes, sir. What would Jesus do? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 this was John Carson a couple years ago, right? He did the whole devotion at, at men's night, and and was was operating on this idea: is what if we understood the strategy of the enemy, right? He used a sports illustration, and then all of a sudden, you got football teams and baseball teams getting sued and stuff because they're cheating, right? But his whole thing was: what if we knew what the play was? What if we knew what the play was? If somebody knew what the offensive play was every single time, they would win. Why? You would cover that receiver. You would fill that hole. You would do whatever's necessary to stop the play because you knew. Well, we do know what the enemy's play is. He's not creative because he can't be creative. Only God can be creative. Only we can be creative because we're creative in his image. Satan is just a liar. 
Hence, if we ask the right questions, what would Satan be doing right now? The answer is lie. The answer is lie. Now the next question is, how is he lying right now? Right? How is he lying right now? He's lying right now because he is telling me that my wife's my enemy. And my objective is to win. He's lying to me because he's telling me that my opinion matters the most and I should squish the other person. That's how he lies. So what if rather than after the event when we feel like an idiot and we have to rep repent and say we're sorry, what if we could catch ourselves in the middle? What if we could catch ourselves before? What if we could start to refine our lives to the point where we're pausing before we think and speak, right? This is why James says that we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. It makes perfect sense. It is very hard to do. And so one of the principles that I think James is trying to get us to understand is that what if we as Christians would do one thing, seek to understand before you want to be understood. Seek to understand before and over you're wanting to be understood. Why? Even if I disagree with someone, how do I know what I'm disagreeing with if I haven't understood? And when I try to understand, I'm valuing the person even if I disagree. If I can ultimately say to someone, so is this right? Is this what you're trying to say? And I can say those words and they can go, yes, I know I understand. At that moment, that person appreciates the fact that I have tried to understand them. We're so quick to react because we live in an American society that like is so angry and so divided and so subdivided that we think we're in a fight all the time. Ravi Zacharias trained all of his evangelists and all of his apologists and he would repeat one phrase all the time. Don't win the debate, win the debater. You can be the smartest person in the room and tear someone apart. Did you win? Yes. Did you really win? No. So he taught his, his men and women who would go to colleges and nasty 22-year-olds would be spewing all this stuff and how do you listen to them and how do you love them even beyond the, what you're receiving and how do you get to you know, forget about their attitude, forget about what they're saying. Do I understand what your question is? Do I understand what your statement is? I hear you saying this. And ultimately, you'll watch the person at the microphone go, yeah. And now comes this thoughtful response. Not a criticism of the individual. Not telling them they're stupid. Not telling them that they're philosophically illiterate. It's simply speaking the truth in love. And all of a sudden, and oftentimes, you'll hear those apologists say, hey, I would love to talk to you after this event. What are they doing? Opening a door. You matter enough that I'll stay here after the event and talk to you. All right. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. We, he said this now three times in three different ways. We should avoid, we should avoid living in our freedom if we're causing someone else to stumble that we should be the ones that sacrifice, not saying to the person who's weaker in the faith, hey, I have the right to do it, right? Everything Paul's saying is that proper love is other-oriented. 
My job is not to love me. My job is not to make my truth the truth of everyone. My job is to love the other individual. My, my job is to meet that person where they are. Show compassion, mercy, understanding. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. It is better to make the decision in the kingdom of this world not to do something you feel free to do if, it, if it's going to affect the eternal journey of another individual. Paul is really saying here, y'all need to have a V8. What in the world are you doing? What in the world are you doing? You're all redeemed at the cross of Jesus Christ. You're all on a journey walking home. You're all, and what are you doing? You're fighting about issues and you're fighting about things and you're, you're making all of these earthly things so important, you're forgetting the kingdom of God. Our job is to become firmly rooted in God's word. Our job is to fall in love with Jesus. Our job is to get other people to do the same thing. It's that simple. You ever thought about the fact that, that, like, how many denominations are there, right? And subdivisions of denominations and subdivisions of denominations? When in reality, there's simply four schools of Christian thinking. Roman Catholicism, Luther, Calvin, and Swingley. Four different views, slightly different views of Christianity. And we got bazillions of church divisions. Over what? Go downtown to some churches like in Detroit and other cities where churches have been in existence for over 100 years and ask them why there's First Baptist and Second Baptist. Or whatever the denomination is right the reason is, is because somebody got mad or a group of people got mad and rather than finding one-mindedness they just took their their ball and went home and created another church right and 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 that stuff I guess you can't help it happening because we're sinful human beings but boy oh boy wouldn't it be nice if we made that less often and unity more often peace more often self you know the mutual edification more often Yeah, especially in a church. You're right that that we're that we're trying to love God, love our neighbor, and and but but see that's yeah. And so what happens is we bring earthly kingdom thinking into God's kingdom. That's the problem. We have to have a clear demarcation in our lives about the two kingdoms, and you and I ought to be very clear and know when we're living in each. There is nothing more clear in my life today than knowing exactly which kingdom I'm in. Whose we are, our, our, our identity, because and, and that's the American spirit, Brian. That the ident my identity is in me. No, it isn't. It's in the one who made you, right? That's, that's like saying that Mustang has its own identity. No, it was made by a corporation and a bunch of men and women who put the thing together and, and, and it, its identity is in the creation of it. Right? It's true for all of it. But now look at our society. We're getting to the point now where like we're crazy in our focus of self. Self-identity, self-gender decisions, self-everything, right? I can recreate myself. I can do it every week, right? I can decide I'm this this week and this that week. and I... No, that's just crazy. No stability, no foundation. 
There's no stability or foundation, and if 300 million people did that, that would be crazy. We would create chaos. But the world might go that way. The church, never. We have to be aware of when we bring kingdom thinking into God's kingdom. The wrong kingdom slides in. We have to be aware in our own lives, because if we're not aware in our own lives, we won't be aware when we do it in church. If you are not, if you do not have the self-control to know which kingdom you're living in, then you will not be able to distinguish that when you're around other Christians. Because you haven't yet learned the discipline. The awareness. Have you ever wondered why Peter was different before Pentecost and after Pentecost? How did he know when he was walking along the road to the temple that, that he could heal that man? Where did those words come from? Do you want me to obey you or God? He's beginning to see two kingdoms very clearly. Where before, he wasn't seeing the two kingdoms very clearly. He's swinging swords and he's doing things and he's, right? He's trying. He's trying, but he's bringing the wrong kingdom into his movements. After Pentecost, you see a clear demarcation of all of these men and women who understand two kingdoms and operate in them with precision, or at least to the best they can. All right. Um, Sarah, when we feel heard, we're much more willing to listen. Win the person, not the argument. Amen. Amen, Sarah. Amen. All right. Verse 22, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. <laughs> Oh, boy, if we kept more things just to ourselves, right? <laughs> and i got to tell you, as, as someone who probably speaks more words than any of you, that's always a danger for me, right? The scariest thing for me is using too many words and then to use them wrongly. Um, it, it's a real challenge in my teaching and preaching and, and counseling and, I mean... Who? Because you're, 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 you're trying to speak from God's kingdom perspective, but it's tough sometimes, right? Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Ouch. Blessed is the individual who does not condemn themselves by what they approve. Wow. But Jesus, I have the right to do that. But you don't have the right to hurt your fellow man. How many times did he tell the Pharisees, you're doing one of the commandments, but I'd rather you do mercy and that. Why, do, why in your religiosity do you forget mercy? Why in your religiosity do you feel so right about everything that you're wrong in how you treat people? The more religious we get, the more argumentative we get, the more defensive we get, the more judgmental we get, because we forget that the same blood was shed on the same cross that set us free. Your religiosity does not impress God. Or anybody else. Or anyone else. It's a barrier. It's, it's a barrier that pushes people away, for sure. For sure. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats. What he's saying is, don't go against your own conscience. Wherever you're at in your faith walk, don't force yourself to do something that other people think is free to do if your own heart isn't right. Obey your heart in these things. Yes, yes. And so he, what, what happens is if we, def, if we keep defying that, we'll deafen ourselves to hear what the Holy Spirit wants. Because well, someday maybe you'll free yourself of it. 
But be true to your conscience. Be true to what the Spirit of God is doing inside of you. And if, and, 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 and if it's no for you, then live the no. Don't do it. Don't, take, don't be pressured by other people to do what they do if it always makes you feel yucky or that wasn't right. Obey your conscience. Oh, without doubt, Brian. Uh huh. Some sometimes things that didn't bother you now do. And then, as a Christian, early Christian, things bothered me, but now they don't anymore. What Paul is saying, it's a journey. Be true to yourself, as the God is speaking to you. Do not defy it because someone else is pressuring you. Live live to your conviction. Live to your conviction. He says, because, he, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that uh, does not come from faith is sin. I like that phrase. You ever thought about that? Everything that, that does not come from faith is sin. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're saying all the right words. You search the scriptures because in them you believe that you'll find the Savior. Here I am and you don't believe me. You are quoting Bible passages. Yes, you you, you tithe. Yes, you fast. But your hearts are far from me. He was so clear that your actions are not coming from faith, they're coming from your will. They're coming from a religious perspective. You have created a world, a worldview, that sits somewhere between the kingdom of this world and my kingdom, but it's neither. If you and I are not living according to the kingdom of God, we're sinning. Ouch. But it's true. What that does is drive us to the cross to be redeemed and forgiven, and all of a sudden we see other people maybe as weak as we are, and we see other people with, with compassion and mercy rather than judgment. A healthy view of yourself that according to your human nature you suck is a proper perspective because you're less likely to say that to someone else. This is why Paul called himself the chief of sinners. I don't have a place in me that I can judge anymore. I don't have a place in me. I used to. I judged everyone. But now that I have been judged by Jesus, now that I have been clearly t- been shown what my issues are, I fall at the foot of the cross and I ask you to fall with me. Right? I ask you to fall the same place. Chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and, and, and not to please ourselves. We should, what, what, what does Paul say in his other writings? That we should bear up under people's burdens, that we should carry their sorrows, that we should forgive them, right? That's the goal. As beloved children of God... We should be kind and compassionate and gentle and caring. We should bear with each other and forgive one another, whatever the grievance there is. That over all these things, we should put on love. There is a prescription of how we're supposed to do this. We who are stronger in the faith, remember that one day we weren't. 
And how dare we now judge someone newer in the faith that they're not where we are. We just took our seniority in faith and made it a, a ritual, a law. And because you don't match where I'm at, you're something less than. When in fact, we're supposed to be walking each other home. The whole picture of discipleship is someone who's mature in the faith has someone who's less mature in the faith following them. And what happens is that raises them up. And then someone follows them. So one of the questions that I, that I have for all of us is your life followable? If a new Christian were to say, can I follow you? Would they find Jesus? Whew. No, you ought to be able to say yes. Because, but what are you all thinking? What you're all thinking is, am I going to do all the right things? Am I going to do God's will? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? No, you're going to be a sinner who screws up and shows them how to find grace. You're not going to judge them. You're going to forgive them. Do you know how many young Christians think that we walk around thinking we're perfect? Because we don't. This is why I preach the way that I do. If I don't talk about the fact that I'm an idiot and make stupid mistakes and stupid decisions, then all of a sudden I create this thing where you're all down here and I'm up here. It ain't true. I've just been gifted with the ability to say what's true. And the darn thing is I have to face it myself. And it's hard. But that's how we live life together. That's how we do this together. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Notice how everything's other focused. Everything is other focused. What can I do for you? What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you in your journey? It's not about me. We make it about us, right, Tim? It's not about me. For even Christ did not please himself. What did Jesus say? I did not come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give my life up as a ransom. How many of us are understanding that servanthood is the number one characteristic of a Christian? Not going to church. Serving your fellow man. Serving another human being. Jesus came and served Believers and unbelievers. He loved on people every single day. How about that? Every single day he woke up, walked around, and found people to love. Sometimes he healed. Sometimes he spoke words of truth. Whatever was necessary, Jesus was always thinking about the other people around him. We got to get out of ourselves. We got to get out of our own heads and start realizing that He has already made me all that I am. It ain't about me. So today, if He gives me another day, it's to speak God's truth and love to you. It, it is to encourage you. It is to lift you up. It is to mutual edification. That today, just leaving Bible study should make us both feel better. Does it mean we didn't face some challenging words? Of course we did. It doesn't mean that we didn't feel a few pokes? Of course. But the cross heals all that. The cross heals all that. And an empty tomb brings us all back to the same place. And now we get up and go again. Now we get up and go again. For even Christ did not play, uh, please himself... As it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Right? He's kind of quoting Isaiah 53. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Notice always when Paul talks about the Christian life lived out as people, he uses words like endurance, perseverance, Bearing one another. He never says, oh, all of your Christian relationships will be perfect and hunky-dory and everyone's going to be smiling and rainbows. What he's saying is it's not easy, but you fight. 
It's always hard, but you do it together. You press to make it work. We're the body of Christ. We are Jesus' body on this earth. We are to fight to stay unified, fight to make sure all the pieces are good, make sure that every part is being working and moving, and so that we can be all that Jesus wants us to be in this world. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of what? Unity among yourselves as you, as you follow Christ Jesus. Imagery. Imagery. If we as a Christian are spending most of our time looking and comparing ourselves with each other, what will that ultimately get us to do? Judge or self-condemn? If I'm focused on Jesus and I'm encouraging you to focus on Jesus, every day I'm just going to find you on the same path walking. See the difference? Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. Fall in love with me and I will fall in love with you. Don't worry about that. Peter says to Jesus, what about that guy? What about John? Don't worry about John. Worry about you and follow me. Your goal is to fall in love with Jesus every single day and follow him. What you're going to do is turn around and see other people struggling to do the same thing. If a fellow brother and sister is falling off that path, our job is to save them and bring them back. Be part of the, the shepherd hook that restores them. Not point a finger at them and go, oh, you idiot. Because see, one day you're going to be the idiot. We want, to, we want to restore each other. We want to bring each other back on the path. And the unifying act is Jesus. That I am so in love with Jesus that I want to bring you back to this. I want to restore you back to being in love with Jesus. Our eyes are on Jesus and not on each other. And when they are on each other, they're with the eyes of Jesus. What Jesus do you want? If you're screwing up, if, if you've gotten a little bit anxious, if, you, if, you, if you've gotten you know, a little insecure and you've gotten angry and frustrated, and what do you want? You want Jesus smacking the back of the head? Or do you want him to kneel next to you and put his, your head between his hands and make you look at his eyes and say, I love you, now get up, stop. That's what I want. That's the Jesus I want. Well, then be that Jesus. Then be that Jesus. How is someone going to experience Jesus if we don't treat people like Jesus would? Correct. Not, not to play the judgment game, but to do what's ever necessary to draw them back in love, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and that's what Jesus would do. Now, does that automatically fix everything? No. At the end of the day, I can only control one side of something. Whose side is that? Mine. Why do we want to control the other person's side? Because as soon as we do that, we're legalistically telling them if they don't fit into the box we want, I'm rejecting you. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says to two sons, go to work. One says I'll go and doesn't. One says I'm not going but does. Which one of them, right? He, we, he allows us to live within our choices, but he's always the same Jesus. 
Our goal should be to lovingly restore things, bring things back to Jesus, bring things back to love. All right. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. One of the things that I think is important is the difference between oida and gnosko. Anybody ever cram for a test, get an A, and not know any of that information a week later? All the time. All the time. Won't work so well with life stuff. See, the things that matter the most, I don't want to just know them in my head. I need to know them in my whole being. That's Gnosko. All of this has been written. All of this has been written, inspired by God, so that you might know. To teach you. That you might gnosko. That you might know Him. That you might know you because you know Him. You realize you will not know who you are until you know who He is. You know how many Christians have this all screwed up? No wonder, no, no wonder American society is lost. We're now less than 50% of people claiming any religious affiliation in America. So we live in, an, we live in, a, in a socially atheistic world. There is no such thing as an atheist. There will always be a God, and it will either be God or you. And then you'll become the God of your own life. And you'll begin to decide that you can decide whatever you want. And then nobody else can tell you what to do because you get to choose what you want to do and everybody can just shut up because you're going to do that. How many people have you ever seen live that successfully? None. They eat themselves. They destroy themselves. They think that because Satan's a liar. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So someone thinks that because of this freedom I've given myself, I'm going to be free, when in fact you just change yourself. Every decision you make, everything that you're saying is one more shackle, one more chain. And Satan is going to swallow you. Because what's in none of it is love. And 20, 30 years down the road, you live a life and going, with what, none of it matters, and not, nothing matters. Right? You're, you're with Solomon saying, life is vanity. It's useless. It has no meaning. Oh. But once you know Jesus, you get to know you. And once you know you, you know what to work on. Right? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Sarah, you can't shame someone into faith. We need someone to guide us into, further, uh, into faith and understanding. Not tell us uh, we don't understand. We know we don't understand. We're looking for guidance, guiding someone. Uh, Keith, your humility is so powerful in your ministry. Keith, thank you very much for that comment. Um, all right, what time is it? Okay. Um, verse 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. Notice this, the sequence. You will find unity as you follow Jesus. I want you to picture 200 people that firmly rooted following Jesus. If 200 people are in love with Jesus and following Jesus, what's the likelihood that we'll have unity? Hi. If we're not really following Jesus, but we're going to church and doing ritual things and we have perspectives on how things should be and I think things should be this way and that way, what's the chances we'll have unity? Zero. What if every single day I understood that I'm not the thing? I'm not all that in a bag of chips. 
Jesus is. And I don't have any meaning without him. I I don't have any purpose without him. I don't have any breath without him. And so I just follow him. And in following him as close as I can, maybe, maybe when other people enter into my life, they see someone who's following Jesus. Who isn't judgmental. Who isn't putting someone down. Who isn't belittling somebody. But is drawing them into the following. Drawing them into this, this path. And then all of a sudden, as we're all just simply every day waking up following Jesus, waking up following Jesus, and we look around and someone else is doing the same thing, and someone else is doing the same thing, we have a unity that Satan would want to say we don't have. We are unified. We're unified because every one of us has to crawl to the cross to get forgiveness. Every one of us looks at an empty tomb and says, woohoo, right? Every one of us. Without those two things, we got nothing. All we got is religious stuff that doesn't matter because I'm still going to meet God and I'm a failure. Friends in Christ, we've got to do this right. And, 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 and what I mean by that is I'm not telling you to do a bunch of stuff. What I'm telling you is get the focus off you. I got too many Christians saying, Pastor, I'm going to try harder. Stop. Just Fall in love with Jesus. Cling to his word. It will transform you. Don't worry about it. It will change you. I have watched a person's life change 180 degrees in one year. All that individual has done is fall in love with Jesus. See, we want to try to shove the Bible down someone's throat. We want to convince them that creation and not evolution is right, right? My argument is, bring them to Jesus. When they know Jesus, they're going to have to start knowing the Word. When they know the Word, they're going to realize the Word's the Word of God. When they realize the Word, of, the word is the Word of God, they're more likely to understand creation. Why are we starting at the fringe when we've got to bring... The, right? That, that, that would be like Pentecost... Without the transformation of the languages. Imagine the 12 disciples and the other disciples going out on Pentecost and speaking in Aramaic. They're shouting the gospel. They're talking about the wonders of God. What percentage of people in Jerusalem can hear? It's lower than if you can take their languages and change them and all of a sudden everyone can hear. It's God the Holy Spirit working through our lives that makes us do things that we've never done before. You don't have to will yourself to do it. If you abide in the vine, the vine is going to produce the the juices. The juices are going to flow through you and you're going to produce fruit. It's that simple. It's that simple. You don't have to will the fruit. You don't have to... uh, You don't have to. You just have to love Jesus and he'll transform you and fruit will start pouring off. Jesus, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you naked and clothe you? When? What they're saying is we were so in love with you, we didn't realize our lives changed. We didn't realize we did that. That was just natural for us. It just became natural for us. I didn't even think about it. I saw that person on the street and I bought him lunch. I didn't think about it. I didn't, hey, I'm going to go do a Christian thing today. Right? No. Right? At that, at that moment, Jesus isn't, isn't impressed. It's the spontaneous love of Jesus flowing through us to another human being saying, you matter to me and you matter to Jesus. That's where it is. And we got to get the churchiness out of our lives and we got to get the love back in. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to stop, Russ. I'm going to start preaching. Um, Maybe I already did. Um, All right, uh, I don't see any new comments. Um, we're going we're gonna to let the, the virtual world go. I'm going to get back to the countdown for the worship service. And uh, then those of us in the room, we're going to pray real quick and, and um, get back.